Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Josh Strife Hayes, and in this video I'm going to explain everything you'll need to know to start playing old school RuneScape. This video is aimed at totally new players, so if you're a returning player, you'll probably know most of what I'm about to tell you. This guide is extremely long, so if you know what you're looking for, use the time codes in the description. But if you're a brand new player, I'm going to cover everything you could ever want to know. Right, there's a hell of a lot to discuss, so let's go. If you've never played old school RuneScape before, it's probably best that I'm honest with you about what you're getting into. Old school RuneScape is currently the second most popular MMORPG in the world, beaten only by the titan that is World of Warcraft. Despite that, I firmly believe it's one of, if not the, best MMORPG in the world. The graphics are old, the gameplay can be clunky, the AI pathfinding is exploitable, the progression is sandbox and the experience gain incredibly slow. It is old school in all the best ways and while I understand it's going to be extremely difficult to shed the years of doughy acceptance and easy mode that many other MMORPGs have covered you in, once you can come to love all these features for the charm they inherently have, you'll have a great time here. Before you even start playing, it's useful to ask if this is the game for you. If you preferred Morrowind over Skyrim because of the immersion and use of in-game text telling you where to go, instead of bright flashing markers pointing everything out, you'll love the quests. If you've ever had the patience to complete Baldur's Gate 1 or 2, Neverwinter Nights or the original Fallout games, choosing tactical combat over fast, flashy animations, you'll enjoy the retro-style top-down gameplay and strategic combat placement. If you're looking for a game where the focus is the journey to the top, instead of just being at the top, then you will love the insane grind that is Old School RuneScape. To start playing, download the Old School Client. This game is often referred to as 2007 Scape, as it's built on the same engine, but don't let the size of the game fool you. Beneath the simplistic looking exterior lies a stunningly complicated adventure. Once you're in, sign up with your email address. You can't have multiple tunes per email, but you also won't need that. There are no classes and no limitations on what you can train, what you can equip, or where you can go. If you are a returning player from several years ago, you can log in using your old character name. New accounts, however, will need an email address. Choose a world from the World Select screen. You can change worlds freely at any time, so don't worry about getting stuck in only one. Silver worlds are free to play, gold worlds are members. We won't worry about membership yet. A quick side note, some worlds are themed, focusing on certain mini-games like Castle Wars or Pest Control. When you want to play these mini-games, go to these worlds and you will always find players. There are often more people playing a single RuneScape minigame on a single RuneScape world than there are playing entire other MMORPGs, which I think is testament to this game's brilliance. Once you've logged in, you'll need to play through Tutorial Island, a very simple linear adventure which will teach you the basics of a few skills. If you've never played this type of game before, I'm going to break it down even more. The camera is top down and can be moved around your character with the arrow keys, or you can hold the middle mouse button and move the mouse. You can zoom in and out with the mouse scroll wheel. The zooming doesn't scale with perspective, which is why it'll often look like you're just getting closer or further away from a flat picture, because due to the game's engine limitations, that's exactly what's happening. Movement in RuneScape is based on a square grid system. Each floor tile can be left clicked on and you'll move there. Once you gain the ability to run, you can click this little run icon up here to start running, but you'll quickly drain your run meter. Your run energy recovers by just walking or waiting, or by drinking energy potions. You can right click on everything and bring up the context menu, which changes depending on what you've right clicked on. If you right click on something you can interact with, like a tree or an enemy, you'll have options relating to them, or the universal walk here command. One of the most frequent complaints I hear from new players is how hard it can be to get used to this grid movement system. 
they click on a tree thinking they've clicked through the tree, or accidentally attack an enemy when they only wanted to step past them. So don't worry if it takes you a while to get used to. You're not the only one. User interface. Let's talk about the user interface. To help navigate, you've got the minimap in the top right, which will turn with the camera. You can click on the minimap to move to that point, but only if there's an unblocked path. Fences, gates and walls can often block your path, so you're forced to get yourself round wherever you want to go to. On the minimap, you'll see various dots of colour. Red are items, yellow are NPCs, white are other players, and green are other players on your friends list. To the left of your minimap are the information orbs, showing important information at a quick glance. Your compass, current remaining hit points, prayer points, run energy, and special attack bar, which you won't need until much later. At the bottom left of the screen you've got your chat box with the various tabs and options. You can customise what shows up. You don't need to press enter to start typing like other MMOs as there are no hotkeys. You can just type and press enter. Everyone's chat shows up above their heads in yellow. If you get sick of the game constantly showering you with useless tips in this chat box, right click on the game tab and change it to filtered reducing the in-game messages to only the essentials. Over on the bottom right, you've got your many tabs. You can only have one tab open at a time, so swapping between them at speed is something of an art. If you're used to a full screen with meters and multiple boxes showing you the status of everything, you might find this change jarring, but the return to simplicity actually makes for some very exciting fights later on in the game. The Crossed Swords is your combat tab, and will change based on which weapon you have equipped. We'll talk more about this in the combat section of the guide. The three coloured bars are your skills, showing your progress toward 99, the max level, of each skill. Hover your mouse over a skill to see your current experience in it, the total experience needed for the next level, and how much you have remaining to go until that level. To reach 99 in any skill, you need roughly 13 million experience. Each level needs more and more than the last. Fun fact, once you reach level 92 in a skill, you're halfway to 99. If you're a free player, members only skills will appear slightly greyed out. The blue star in a white circle is your quest tab and lists all the free to play, then members only quests. You earn quest points for each quest you do, and you'll see your total listed at the top. These three colour stars to the right are stars you can switch between, and will show your achievement diaries, minigame scores, and core end favour, which you won't need to worry about until you're a member. Quests in old school RuneScape are widely regarded as the gold standard of quest writing. You won't find any kill X amount or go collect X amount quests here. Every quest is a well-written story with named characters. And as the various quest lines progress, you'll see how they all interact with each other to create a full and complete world. To start a quest, click on the quest name in the list and you'll be shown the recommended, or sometimes required, levels. Some quests won't require you to have a certain level, but will be much harder if you are lower leveled. To start a quest, you need to talk to the NPC quest giver, listed in the quest guide. The quest giver NPC will show up on the minimap with the blue star quest symbol next to them. There is no quick travel option to start a quest, you have to go and talk to them. When you talk to an NPC, and I cannot stress this enough, read the words. This isn't a game about rushing through the quest to achieve the reward. Often the fun of a quest comes from actually experiencing the story. Yes, some quests do have amazing items and large chunks of XP as a reward, but the writing is truly brilliant. If you do rush the conversation and can't remember what you're meant to do, click on the quest tab, and then on the quest name. Quests you're on but haven't finished will show up in yellow. 
completed quests will show up in green. The brown bag icon is your inventory. You have 28 spaces and there is no way to expand this. Later in the game you will find items like the rune pouch or the crossbow bolt pouch which lets you consolidate items into a single space, but for now you've got 28 slots and that's it. Each item will only take up one inventory slot no matter how physically big that item is. You can click and drag items around to swap them from slot to slot. To pick an item up from the ground, right click on it and select take. To drop something, right click on it in your inventory and select drop. Items you drop will be visible to only you for a short time and will then show up to other players. So do not drop something if you need it. Sometimes on a quest you'll need to use an item from your inventory on something else in the game world, like putting a skull back into a coffin. Right click on the item in your inventory, click use, then click on the object in the game world. Quick side note, left clicking any item in your inventory will cause the most useful option to happen. Left clicking food will eat it, left clicking equipment will equip it. That can sometimes be a problem. If you need to use a food item on something else and you left click it by mistake, you won't use it, you'll eat it. You only make this mistake with important quest items once. This little man wearing armor tab is your equipment tab, showing what you've got equipped in your equipment slots. There are no classes in RuneScape, so you can equip any mix of items providing you have the correct level to wear them. Mage hat and ranger body with melee gloves, warrior helm with hunter cloak, bow with full plate armor. Whatever you like, it's your choice. In your equipment tab, you'll see these four buttons at the bottom. The helm and shield button shows your equipment stats, listing all the attack and defense bonuses you have. Different weapons give different attack bonuses, and armor gives different armor bonuses. Some armor gives negative bonuses to other things, so you'll be building around what you want to achieve. We'll talk about this more in the combat section. You'll also see the total weight of everything you have equipped and carried down here. This weight amount includes everything you're wearing and everything in your inventory. The heavier you are, the longer it will take for your run energy to recover. And on some quests, it'll have you walking over old wooden bridges which can only hold a certain amount of weight. Then you'll see this money bag icon. This is your price guide. Click it to open the Grand Exchange Guide Prices box. The Grand Exchange is RuneScape's marketplace and will be explained in the trading section of this guide. For now, click any item in your inventory to see its current average price on the Grand Exchange. You can also search for an item to see its current price by clicking this magnifying glass box here and typing the item's name in. This lets you look up prices if you ever need to compare, or if you want to dump your entire inventory into the price checker to get a rough value, click the bag with a green arrow icon. Once you click X to close this box, all your items will go back to your inventory. This bag with a skull and crossbones over it shows your items kept on death. Death is a big thing in RuneScape, and we'll talk about it in the dying section of this guide. This silver diamond icon is your prayer tab, showing all the prayers you've unlocked. Click on a prayer symbol to activate it. A prayer is a constant passive buff given to your character. You can see what each prayer does by hovering your mouse cursor over it. Each prayer you have active will drain your prayer points. Your total prayer points are equal to your prayer level. You can have multiple prayers active at once, but only one of each type. So if you, for example, have access to both Thick Skin and Rock Skin, as they both boost your defense, you have to decide which one to use. To restore the prayer points once they're empty, pray at any of the many altars in the world. Altars are free, and have the little altar symbol on the minimap. The Book tab is your Magic tab and shows all your spells. At the bottom of this tab you'll see Filters button. I have everything ticked to green so I can see every spell even if I can't cast it yet. 
Mage spells range from offensive damaging spells, to enchanting support spells, to teleporting yourself or others around the world. To cast a magic spell, you need both the correct mage level and the required runes. Hover your mouse over any spell to see the level and required runes for that spell. We'll talk about combat magic in the combat section and teleportation magic in the getting around section of this guide. The little yellow smiley face is your friends list. As you meet people in the game and chat to them, you can right click on their name in the chat box and choose add friend. Or you can click the add friend button and type their name in. You can only send private messages to people you are friends with. Your friends list will show you whether they're online or offline, and if they are online, which world they are in. If you are online but want to appear offline to people, maybe to prevent private messages and play in peace for a bit, right click on the private tab under your chat box and set it to off. Back to the friends tab, if you click the unhappy red face in the top right, you'll see your ignored list. If a player is sending you spam or generally being disruptive, add them to this list. This will prevent them from seeing you as online and also hide their in-game chat from appearing to you, both above that player's head and in your chat box. Your friends and ignore list can only hold a limited amount of people, which increases if you are a member, so you might need to delete people if it gets a bit too full. The tab of the man's face next to a gear icon is the account management tab. You won't use this much, it's needed to change your in-game name, read any messages sent to you by Jagex, the makers of the game, upgrade to a member, or visit the official old school website. This will probably be the tab you click on the least. The icon with two smiley faces is your clan chat tab. Once you're over 150 total skill level, you'll be able to talk in clan chats. To enter a chat, simply click Join Chat, then type the name of the player who owns the chat. If we take my clan as an example, it's Josh Strife. Once you're in the clan chat, you can see a list of all the other players who have joined. To talk in clan chat, type a forward slash before your message. Clan chat works across all worlds and is the easiest way to talk to a group of friends. The clan setup button is used by the clan owner, so we won't cover that in this guide. The little spanner icon is your options tab, and it has eight subsection tabs inside it, concerning graphics, sound, in-game chat, camera controls, accepting aid, another alternative way to turn your run on or off, player housing options, and bonds, which are in-game items you can buy with in-game gold to pay for your membership. Instead of explaining this entire section to you, just click on things and see what happens. It's pretty self-explanatory. This man waving icon is the emotes tab. While many games deal with emotes by typing slash dance or slash sit, RuneScape has a whole list of things you can do and you have to click on them. Emotes are mainly used for fun, although some of them are needed to complete quest objectives or minigames. If you scroll down, you'll see some emotes are greyed out. These are the ones you haven't discovered yet. You'll find them through random events, quests, or minigames. The harp icon is your sound tab, and lists all the music you've unlocked in the game so far. Red tracks are locked, green tracks are unlocked. You can click on any green track to play it. People may mock RuneScape music for being simplistic, but if you don't think Sea Shanty 2 is the greatest piece of in-game music ever, then I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Intro to gameplay. Right, that's the user interface covered, you've finished Tutorial Island, and you've been dropped into Lumbridge. Now comes the first big question, and the extremely scary answer. The question you'll ask is, well what do I do now? And the answer I'll give you is, what do you want to do? RuneScape is a sandbox game meaning almost the entire world is open to you immediately. There's no level scaling, and nothing to stop you from walking up to a crazy powerful monster and dying instantly. RuneScape isn't going to hold your hand or give you any sort of indication about what to do or who to do it with. It's old school, in the best and worst ways. Complete freedom to do whatever you want must also include complete freedom to get totally lost and fail. 
It's liberating and terrifying at the same time. So I'm going to talk you through what you probably should do to start off with. Here we go. Banking. Before we start killing things, run west through the courtyard into Lumbridge Castle. Then climb the southwest tower by right-clicking and selecting Climb Up Staircase. You'll appear on the first floor. Right-click the staircase again and select Climb Up again, and you'll appear on the roof. Run into that little room in the middle of the roof. This is your first bank. You'll see the money icon on the minimap. That's a bank. Left-click the bank booth, or right-click and select Bank. This is your bank screen. You can access your bank from any bank in the world. Free players can store up to 400 items, members can store more. You can click and drag items in your bank freely around to swap their position. To move an item from your bank to your inventory, click it. And the same to move from your inventory to the bank. When you withdraw an item from the bank, you can click this little button here to withdraw it as a note instead. A noted item will only take up one inventory space and, unlike the actual item, can be stacked. So instead of withdrawing 20 fish and taking up 20 spaces, I could withdraw a note representing 20 fish. Notes, however, cannot be used as the item, because it's not the item, it's just a note representing the item. So if I did withdraw 20 noted tuna and then needed to eat them to get my health back, I'd be out of luck. You can swap notes for the items at any bank. Items that can already be stacked, like runes or arrows, cannot be noted. Click and drag any item in your bank to this little plus tab at the top to start a new tab. You can have multiple bank tabs and place anything in any tab. The bank does not have an auto sort feature, but you can click this little magnifying glass and search by item name. As an example, if I type rune, I'll be able to see every item in my bank with the word rune in the item name. To quickly bank your entire inventory, click this bag with a green arrow icon. To quickly bank everything you have equipped, click the little man with the green arrow. If you right click an item and select withdraw X, you'll be able to type your own number in. The game will then remember this X number and always give you that option above until you type X again where it will change it. Combat. Okay, enough talk, let's kill something. Combat is a part of RuneScape, but maybe not the biggest part. There are players who don't train combat at all, and we generally refer to them as skillers. If combat isn't your thing, you'll find plenty more to do. But if you're like me, and enjoy going toe-to-toe -to -toe with massive enemies, let's break down the combat system. Old School RuneScape does have a combat triangle, but it's not tank, healer and DPS. It's three types of DPS, melee, range and mage. In Old School RuneScape, everyone is responsible for their own tanking and their own healing. What you need to decide on is how you're going to do the DPS. Combat is mostly one-on-one, -on -one, and you won't be able to attack an enemy if another player is already fighting it. However, in multi-combat areas like the Wilderness or Boss Rooms, it's a free-for-all. Attack whatever you like, regardless of who hit it first. You'll be able to tell when you're in a multi-combat area by these crossed swords shown under the minimap. Unseen Combat Mechanics Melee, Range and Mage are, in general, a rock, paper, scissors trinity. Melee fighters kill rangers, Rangers kill mages, mages kill melee fighters. This is because the armor of that style gives huge negative bonuses against the other style. Melee plate armor has high range defense, but actually increases the damage you'll take from magical attacks. The leather armor of rangers reduces magical damage a lot, but is virtually useless against the slashing weapons of melee fighters. To understand combat of any style, we need to understand the tick system. Old School RuneScape has an in-game clock counting down every tick, and a tick 
is 0.6 seconds. All weapons have certain speeds and will attack every few ticks, with slower weapons taking more ticks to hit, but hitting harder. Faster weapons like daggers hit more often, but do less damage. Performing certain actions during combat, like eating or moving, will reset the tick timer, making your combat seem slower. Certain actions like eating or activating a prayer at the exact millisecond needed to avoid interrupting the tick system is the sign of an extremely advanced player, and is commonly referred to as tick manipulation. You won't need to worry about this until extremely high level, just know that for those of you who are skilled enough to click fast, it does exist. While playing RuneScape, you'll see other players have a combat level above their head when you right-click on them. You can see your own combat level by clicking on the Combat tab, the Crossed Swords. You'll start at combat level 3 and increase as your combat stats level up. If an enemy or player has a combat level greatly below yours, it will appear in green when you click on them, showing that they are not a threat. As they get closer to your level, it will go orange, and finally, if they're heavily above you, it will appear red. The combat level calculator is complex and involves your defense, prayer, hit points, and then whichever is higher from your attack and strength, magic, or range levels. If you really want to read more about exactly how combat level is calculated, I'll post a link to the wiki page in the description below. Combat. General defense and hit points. There are three styles of combat. Melee, mage, and range. And while I'm going to discuss each one, you need to be aware that the defense stat is useful to all of them. Higher defense will reduce the damage taken and allow you to wear better armor from all three styles. So while defense itself is not tied to any specific style, it's needed by all three. During any combat, you'll see a green bar above your head and the enemy's head. That is your hit point bar. There are no numbers on the bar, but as you lose health, the bar will empty, showing how close to death you are. Melee. Right, now you understand how ticks work, let's talk about melee combat first. Melee is the ancient art of hitting stuff in the face until it dies. Melee combat involves two main stats, attack and strength. Attack is your accuracy, and a higher attack level allows you to use more exotic weapons and hit more often, and strength is your power, and will allow you to hit things harder. A higher strength level is sometimes needed to wield the more aggressive, heavier weapons. Melee weapons tend to be more expensive than mage or range weapons. This is because mages need to buy runes, and rangers need to buy arrows. But melee fighters, once we have a weapon, it's for life. Equip a melee weapon, then open your Equipped Item tab, and click on Equipment Stats. You'll see the Stab, Slash, and Crush stats. Certain weapons are better at certain things, and certain enemies are weak or resistant to certain things. A scimitar is a great slashing weapon, but awful at stabbing. A warhammer is good for crushing, but bad at everything else. When you have a weapon equipped, go and fight an enemy. I'd recommend the goblins and rats around Lumbridge to start. While in combat with anything, click on the little crossed swords combat tab to see your fighting options. Melee weapons will have three or four combat attack styles to choose from. Hover your mouse over the styles to get some information about them. If an attack is accurate, it will raise your attack stat. If it's aggressive, it will raise your strength. And defensive goes toward your defense. Controlled splits the experience evenly. Personally, I don't like controlled. It levels too slowly for me, and I've always prioritized getting my attack and strength up before defense. Along with focusing on a specific stat, each attack will have a type, which is stab, slash, or crush. Remember when we looked at the attack bonuses earlier? This is where they matter. If I equip a scimitar, which excels at slashing, but is bad at stabbing, then I choose an attack style, I want to make sure I'm choosing a slash attack, because stabbing isn't going to get me anywhere fast. Check what attack style your weapon is strong at, and then make sure 
that you use that style. Every time you do a single point of damage, you'll gain four experience. It does not matter what level the enemy you kill is, you get experience per point of damage inflicted, not per enemy killed. This means efficient training is actually about hitting high and hitting constantly, not just taking down the biggest, baddest monster you can. A quick example would be, if you're training the accurate style to give experience to your attack stat and you hit 3 damage, you'll gain 12 experience in attack. Every single point of damage you do to an enemy, regardless of the combat style you're using, will give between 1.3 and 1.4 experience to your hit point stat. So you'll level hit points constantly through fighting anything. Melee fighters normally wear heavy metal armor, full helms and plate. This increases your defense against other melee fighters and rangers, but greatly decreases it against mage and magical attacks. If you're wearing full metal armor and you try to fight a mage, even if they're lower level than you, you're going to take a lot of damage. The advantages of melee combat are, you'll never run out of ammunition, you can hit consistently, and you'll be highly defended against melee and range. The disadvantages are you need to be right next to the enemy, and mages will kill you easily. Magic. If you want to throw some spells at people and kill your enemy from far away, magic is the place to be. Starting as simple single target spells, mages eventually gain access to huge group freezing spells and can dominate minigames. Magic combat only cares about your magic stat. Mages will generally use wooden staffs and wear cloth armor or robes. The higher your magic level, the better spells you'll be able to cast and the more damage you'll do. Mage spells can come in various elemental varieties, air, earth, water, and fire, and certain enemies will be weak or resistant to certain types, so use a spell that's most effective against that specific enemy. If you don't have a magical staff of some sort equipped, you won't be able to auto-cast magic spells in combat. You'll have to click and manually cast each time from the magic tab. This is far too slow, so always make sure you've got a magic staff equipped. Once you've got your staff equipped, open the combat tab. Each staff has melee attacks available to it, but these are rubbish and we'll never use them. What we care about are the two types of spell auto attack. The spell and shield auto attack will split your experience between magic and defense, and the book will give all the experience to your magic stat. Click either of them, then choose a spell. You'll need to have the correct magic level and the correct runes on you to be able to cast it. Higher level spells require higher level and greater quantities of runes. Some staffs, like the Staff of Air or the Staff of Fire, provide unlimited amounts of that type of rune while you have them equipped. This can save you a lot of money on runes. Once you've chosen your combat spell, click an enemy and start throwing some magic at them. Now, magic experience will go up a lot faster than melee and range. Here's why. You'll gain the regular 4 experience per damage hit, just like melee and range, but you'll also gain a certain amount of base experience just for casting the spell, even if it doesn't hit anything. This, unfortunately, can lead to a very abusable training method. See, if you ever see someone in full metal armor casting spells at a low-level enemy, they're doing what we call splashing. The armor lowers their magic attack bonus so low that they'll never ever hit anything, but they'll still get the experience from casting the spell. It's seen mostly in low-level areas like Lumbridge or the Varrock sewers. Magic starts cheaper because the armor and weapons are cheaper than melee, but you'll quickly spend a small fortune on runes, so don't expect to hit 99 anytime soon. While training either mage or range, you can take advantage of the awful pathfinding AI and make enemies get stuck against chairs, tables, or corners, so they can't hit you, 
but you can hit them. The advantages of being a mage are you'll hit high, and you're able to hide from enemies. The disadvantages are if the enemy gets close to you, you've got very little defence, and you're limited by your runes. Also, mage robes are especially weak to ranger's arrows, so the advantages of being far away quickly disappear when a lower level ranger can constantly hit very high numbers against you. Range. Ranged combat is very similar to mage. They both attack from a distance and they both need ammunition, but while mages use runes, rangers use arrows. Rangers use various types of bow, which are two-handed and cannot be used with a shield, or crossbow, which are one-handed and can be used with a shield. Bows use arrows and crossbows use bolts. Your ranged accuracy and damage are both tied to your ranged stat. A higher ranged stat allows you to wield better bows, and each bow is limited to which arrows it can use. Better bows can fire better arrows. The bow you use will increase your accuracy, and the arrow you use will increase your damage. So even with the best bow in the world, firing basic bronze arrows will still hit low. So use the best arrows that you can afford. If you open your Equipment Stats menu by clicking on the Equip tab and then Show Equipment Stats, you'll see your Ranged Attack bonus here, which is your Accuracy, and your Ranged Strength here, which is how hard you can actually hit. Unlike the Mage runes, however, arrows can be picked up again after being fired. Just walk over and grab them from the floor. Arrows need to be equipped before you can use them, and you can only have one type of ranged ammunition equipped at a time, shown on your Equipped Items screen. While you have a bow equipped, your Combat tab will show three options – Accurate, Rapid, or Long Ranged. Accurate fires slightly slower, but with an increased chance to hit, and gives ranged experience. Rapid reduces the tick count between shots, but doesn't hit quite as often and also gives range experience, and long range increases the distance your weapon will fire, allowing you to be even further away from the enemy, and gives both ranged and defence experience. When starting to train range, it's recommended to stick with accurate or rapid, as a higher range level will let you use better bows and arrows quicker and level up faster. Rangers wear leather armour, then later in the game, Dragonhide. Range armor is great at absorbing the magical energy from mage attacks, but awful at stopping the slashing attacks of melee fighters. So while you'll be able to snipe mages from a distance, if a warrior closes the gap and starts hitting you, you'll be in trouble. Just like a mage, you can take advantages of the questionable pathfinding AI to safe spot all the enemies. Just remember to pick up your arrows afterwards. The advantages of being a ranger are the ability to hit enemies from a distance and tear through those annoying mages. The disadvantages are you're limited by the level of arrow you use, and if a melee fighter gets close to you, you'll lose. Healing. So you're fighting an enemy in your preferred style, be that melee, mage, or range, and they've been hitting you quite a bit, lowering your hit points. How do we get them back? There are multiple ways, but here are the three main ones. Number one. Eat food. Food refills hit points. Better food restores more HP. Food can include bread, cakes, fish, meat, potions, cocktails, sandwiches, fruit. There's loads of food in this game. Gathering food is linked heavily to the fishing and cooking skills, which we'll talk about later. Just for now, know that a full inventory of food is always a good idea when fighting anything. Number two, just wait. You'll recover one hit point every minute. So while this is a very, very slow method, it will always be there for you. Hit points only recover this way while you're logged on. So if you're low on hit points and you log out, you'll still be low on hit points when you log back in. And number three, die. It sounds stupid, but sometimes it's the best choice. Reach zero health and you'll be returned to Lumbridge at full health and any drained stats will be restored to their total value. This is probably a good time to talk about how death works in Old School RuneScape. Death. Dying in RuneScape is a big deal. 
If you've played other MMORPGs where it's a constant cycle of die, respawn, try again, prepare to be shocked, as dying in RuneScape, especially on a quest, at a boss, or far from a bank, is actually a damn difficult thing to recover from. When your hit points reach zero, you'll die. By default, you'll respawn in Lumbridge, although this respawn location can be changed later in the game. When you die, you will keep your three most valuable items and drop everything else on the floor. To see what those items are, click the Equipment tab, then click on Items Kept on Death. The items listed here will be kept, and the items underneath will all be dropped. You'll also be able to see the total value of all lost items listed on the left. The level 25 prayer protect item will allow you to keep one more, but having the prayer active drains your prayer remarkably quickly. When you die and drop your items, they won't be visible to other players for 60 minutes, giving you one hour to go back and pick them up. After those 60 minutes are up, however, the items will show up for all other players to loot. If you die in a safe minigame, such as Pest Control, you won't lose anything on death. If you've been sculled by attacking another player, and then you die, you'll instantly drop everything you're carrying and wearing. The only way to keep one item is to have Protect Item Prayer on. We'll talk more about being sculled and PvP in the PvP section of this guide. Skills. The next part of the guide is going to look at every skill in the free-to-play game and give you a very simple foundation-level explanation of what they do. This isn't a full complete skill guide, it's a beginner intro to everything. Training a skill involves doing that skill. That may sound simple, but many MMORPGs allow you to level up and get better at everything just through combat, not RuneScape. If you want to get better at mining, you've got to go and mine. You can see the complete list of what any skill can do by opening the Stats tab and clicking on that skill. The max level of any skill is 99, and achieving that takes 13 million experience points. So while most MMORPGs begin at endgame, as they say, RuneScape is the opposite. It's all about the journey to the endgame. It won't be fast, and it won't be easy, but for those of you who do make it, it will be very rewarding. For a full, complete, in-depth guide about every specific skill, I'll be putting out detailed videos on everything. For now, here are the basics. Right, let's go over the skills in the order they appear. Attack. Attack is a combat skill mainly concerned with melee accuracy. Higher attack levels allow you to use increasingly powerful melee weapons and will reduce the amount of times you miss. Attack experience is gained at 4 XP per single damage dealt while using an accurate combat style. As you level attack and unlock access to new and more powerful tiers of weapons, always use them. You'll do more damage and thus gain more experience. To train attack, use melee weapons on the accurate combat style. You should start by killing the goblins outside of Lumbridge Castle. Strength. Strength is about how much melee damage you hit. High strength won't increase your accuracy, but will increase your maximum hit. Strength is needed to wield some of the heavier weapons, like halberds or great axes. To train strength, use melee weapons on the aggressive combat style. Same as attack, start by killing the goblins outside Lumbridge Castle. Defense. Defense is all about not being hit, and while your defense stat does provide some defense itself, its main use is to allow you to equip better armour from all three combat styles. To train your defence, use a defensive or controlled melee combat style, or a long range range combat style, or use the defensive spellcasting style. Ranged. Ranged is all about bows and crossbows, and at higher levels, cannons or javelins. You kill enemies from far away by shooting various types of ammunition from various weapons. To train ranged, Equip a bow, crossbow, knives, darts, or any other ranged weapon, and do damage with it. Experience is gained at the regular rate of 4 XP per damage done. 
you can start by safe spotting the cows in Lumbridge Field or the goblins east of Lumbridge Castle. Prayer. Prayers are constant buffs you apply to yourself by activating them, and then as they are active, they drain your prayer points. To refill your prayer points, pray at an altar. Prayer is levelled by burying bones. Average bones give 4 experience per bone, and higher level bones, such as big bones or dragon bones, give more experience. Prayer is very slow to level in a free-to-play world. Magic. Your magic level allows you to cast offensive, support, or teleportation spells. Magic combat can do high damage against heavily armoured opponents, but is less effective against leather or animal skin wearing opponents. Support magic like high level alchemy or enchant crossbow bolts allow you to turn items into gold or make crossbow bolts stronger, and teleportation magic helps greatly with getting around, allowing you to move from one city to another or to teleport other people. Casting magic spells costs runes. To level magic, cast any spell for the base experience gain. And if it's a combat spell, you'll also gain more magic experience if the attack does damage. You can head to the Wizard's Tower, west of Lumbridge Swamp, and attack the caged lesser demon at the top without being hit. Runecrafting. Runecrafting is the art of turning blank rune stones, or rune essence, into usable rune stones. To start runecrafting, you must finish the Rune Mysteries quest, then be teleported to the rune essence. The fastest way to do this is through the rune shop in Varok, as it's closest to a bank. Mine the rune essence to gain blank rune stones, then use a talisman of a certain style to enter that specific rune altar. Use the rune essence on the altar to convert it into those rune stones. Runecrafting is a slow, tedious process, but at high levels generates millions of gold in profit. To train runecrafting, you simply need to bring the blank rune essence to the altars. The air altar is south of Falador. Construction is a members-only skill and is all about building your own house that other players can come and visit. Hit points are your total life and is leveled up by doing any amount of combat damage to any enemy with any combat style. Agility is a members-only skill and allows you to use shortcuts hidden around the world to get around faster. It also helps your run energy recharge quicker. You train it by running around the obstacle courses found in the world. Herb law is members only and involves cleaning then combining various herbs and plants with other reagents to create powerful potions to boost stats. Extremely expensive to train but very useful. It's trained by cleaning the herbs and then making the potions. Thieving is a members only skill and is all about pickpocketing NPCs, opening treasure chests and stealing items from market stalls. It's trained by being successful in a thieving attempt. At higher levels, you'll be able to rob an ancient pyramid of its treasure. Crafting is the artisan skill of chiseling gems, tanning leather, and creating jewellery or armour, or crafting pots and bowls. You can train it by sewing armour, chiseling gems, or blowing glass. Collect cowhide from Lumbridge Cowfields, tan it at the tanner in Alcarid, then use a needle and thread to turn it into simple leather. Fletching is a members-only skill and is the art of making arrows. You'll carve logs into arrow shafts, add smithed arrowheads and then feathers to create complete arrows. At higher levels, you'll be able to carve and string bows or create javelins. Slayer is a members-only skill and replaces the Go Kill X Amount of Enemies quests that every other MMORPG has. Once your combat level is high and you're craving a challenge, a Slayer Master will assign you a task and you'll have to go and kill it. Some Slayer enemies require a task to be active before you can harm them, and they drop some extremely rare loot. You train Slayer by completing the tasks. Hunter is a members only skill and involves tracking and then trapping animals for their fur, bones or meat. High level hunters can create ranged ammo from animal bones and armour from their skin. You train Hunter by placing traps and stalking specific Hunter animals. Mining is the art of hitting a rock with a pickaxe until you've got the ore. You start mining copper and tin and end up mining rune to create high level items. There are mining spots all over the world and you train mining by just, well, mining. There are tin and copper rocks to start at at the mining spot east of Varok. 
Smithing is the process of turning the raw, mined material into metal bars, and then those metal bars into useful items. Smiths can create plate armour for warriors, arrowheads for fletchers, and at high levels make cannonballs for the cannon, or even fix the shards of the powerful god sword back together. You train smithing by turning raw material into smithed items. Use the furnace north of Lumbridge to turn ore into bars, and then the anvils in Varrock to smith them into items. Fishing. You'll start by throwing a net to catch shrimp, and end by catching sharks with your bare hands. Fishing can sometimes involve standing on a riverbank with others and fly fishing for salmon, or travelling to the edge of the world and looking for lobsters. Fishers then cook the fish and sell it to others. To train fishing, simply go and fish. There's a low-level fishing spot just south of the Lumbridge graveyard, then multiple spots all along the River Lum. Cooking is the art of preparing food, from simple fish or bread to luxury cakes and brewed ales. You can cook raw food on a fire or on a range. Higher level cooks will have a greater chance of not burning things, and higher level food restores more hit points or boosts more stats. You can train cooking by successfully making whatever it is you're trying to make. To start, pick up raw meat dropped by cows or rats, then cook it over a fire or range. Fire making is the art of setting stuff on fire usually the logs that woodcutters have cut down, but sometimes torches for exploring caves or fire arrows for taking down certain enemies. Players often make long lines of fires at the Grand Exchange to train this quickly, but being a good fire maker lets you make a fire anywhere and then use it to cook on. Use a tinderbox on any logs to start a fire. Pick up the logs that respawn at the top of Lumbridge Castle to start. Woodcutting is all about turning trees into logs. You need an axe to cut any tree down. Higher level axes will cut higher level trees down faster. Gathering the logs is all you need to do to train woodcutting, but once you've got whatever logs they may be, you can sell them to fletchers who'll make arrows, or fire makers who will burn them. Start by cutting down the normal trees around Varrock Bank, just south of the Grand Exchange, as you can bank them right there. And finally, farming. A member's only skill about tending to your crops and growing either food, trees, or herbs. Farming can be very slow to level, but gives you a constant supply of high-level seeds to sell, or herbs to make potions out of. The reason RuneScape's economy is so strong is every skill supports multiple others. The miner will gather ore for the smither, who creates arrowheads for the fletcher, who buys logs from the woodcutter, who uses an axe sold to them by the melee adventurer, eating food made by the cook, who cooked the fish sold by the fisher. It's a constant cycle that you can choose to be every part of if you want to, or specialise in a certain area. Old school RuneScape's economy and trade culture demands teamwork and supply lines be set up, from gatherers to users. Getting around. So that's a brief rundown of all the skills. How do you get around this world of Gylenor? Well, if you've come from other MMORPGs and you're used to fast travel or convenient quick transport, sorry, but you're walking for a while. There are quick methods, but you need to work for them. Mage spells include teleportation to major cities, but you need to level mage up. Leveling your magic up and gaining access to various teleport spells should be one of the first things you think about doing, unless you fancy walking for hours and hours. You will eventually have a plethora of magical rings, amulets, capes and spells that link you to every part of the world, but until you earn the right to use them, open the world map, and get walking. I would compare RuneScape's transport system to the philosophy of Dark Souls 1. You don't get the ability to travel quickly until you're halfway into the game, and by then, you've not only earned it, but gained a level of appreciation for the world map. There are no mounts in either the free or members game, but a good place to start for some free teleportation would be head to Draenor Village and chat to this guy here. You want to buy a chronicle, and then fill that chronicle with teleport pages, purchased from the same guy. Right-clicking the chronicle in your inventory and choosing teleport will instantly teleport you just south of the rock, giving you easy access to the Grand Exchange. If you get truly lost and have no idea where to go, you always have access to the free home teleport spell. It will send you back to Lumbridge where you began the game, but it does have a very long cooldown of 30 minutes, so don't rely on it too much. Trading and the Grand Exchange I've talked about how RuneScape is an inherently social game, and the economy relies on other players to function, with each skill adding or removing from the flow of trade and barter. To see the beating heart of this commerce, you need to head to the Grand Exchange. Make your way to Varrock, 
one of the largest free-to-play cities. It's north of Lumbridge and east of Falador. Just open your world map and start walking. Once you get there, head northwest and you'll find the Grand Exchange, or GE. This is Old School RuneScape's marketplace or auction house. The GE covers all worlds, so if you make an offer to buy something, it'll instantly scan every single world to find you that thing. It doesn't matter which world you are on. Right click on a Grand Exchange clerk and choose Exchange. Free players can have up to three offers, either buying or selling at any time, and members can have eight. The arrow pointing into the bag is for buying something, and the arrow pointing out is for selling. Let's try buying something. Click the arrow into the bag. On the offer screen, click on the blank square with the magnifying glass. This is your search box. Then type the name of an item. All items with a matching name will be listed below. If I type bronze, I'll see everything with the word bronze in its name. Let's click the battle axe. The quantity on the left is how many you want to try and buy, and can be increased by 1, 10, 100, or 1000, or manually up and down with the plus and minus signs. On the right you'll see the average price of this item. You can attempt to buy anything for any price you like. These up and down arrows here will increase or decrease the current offered amount by 5%. If you want to sell the rarest item in the game for a single gold coin, the game will let you, so don't do that. Trading between players is as simple as right-clicking that player and choosing trade. They'll get a small line of text in their text box saying this player would like to trade with you. You can right-click that line or the other player and accept the trade. If you place something up for trade and then remove it, a large flashing red exclamation mark will be placed where the item was. This is to prevent people quickly swapping items out and trying to scam you. Always double check the trade on the second screen before finally accepting it. PVP This will sound silly or even unbelievable to those who have never experienced it, but Old School RuneScape has some of the most intense PVP of any MMORPG ever. Don't let the simplistic graphics or tick-based combat fool you. The game can get the adrenaline pounding like no other. With death being meaningful and combat so subtly complex, PvP in Old School RuneScape is alive and well. Old School RuneScape player killing, or PKing, will generally happen in the Wilderness, or the Wildy, an area of extreme danger to the far north of the map. Entering the Wildy by crossing the boundary shows you understand you're about to enter a PvP area and are either going to attack, or be attacked, by others. Once you hop the wilderness ditch, you're in the wildy. You'll see a level counter on the screen. This level counter means the range you can be attacked by relevant to your own combat level. If I'm combat level 30, and in level 10 wilderness, that's 30 plus or minus 10 levels, so I can be attacked from anyone level 20 to 40. The further north you go, the higher the wilderness level becomes, and so the more unfair the fights can be. Some areas of the wilderness are multi-combat, so be aware you could be jumped by an entire clan of player killers. If you attack first, you'll become Skulled, shown by a skull and crossbones above your head. Along with letting every other player know that you're a player killer, being Skulled also means that if you die, you'll drop all your items, instead of keeping the three most valuable. As this is a beginner's guide, you won't be experiencing high-level PvP yet. That will be another guide. But when you do, it's fast, intense, extremely high risk, and very, very unforgiving. Don't say you've not been warned. Membership. If you've played for a few weeks, leveled up a few skills, and are generally enjoying the old-school gameplay, you should look into becoming a member. Paying members gain access to more skills, way more quests, and a world almost ten times larger. You don't need to pay to enjoy RuneScape. The free game isn't a demo. It's a complete game by itself. Look at the members' world as a huge expansion. This guide is for beginners, and so I'm not going to cover the perks of being a member, but look out for my new members guide for a complete rundown of all membership benefits. In conclusion... If you're still here, then well done. You've sat through a complete, comprehensive beginner's guide to RuneScape. I'm not going to tell you the most effective place to train, or the most effective items to equip, because that's for you to find out. The fun and appeal of this old-school game is, it's not easy. And it's not just given to you. You're expected to put some effort in. Learn. 
Be ready and work to beat the game. It's the spirit of exploration that drives Dungeons and Dragons, Baldur's Gate, Morrowind, EverQuest, and all the other old school games that we love. Old school RuneScape isn't for everyone, and it doesn't try to be. That's exactly why I love it. And it's exactly why millions of players all around the world still log on to grind out skills, loot bosses, and play mini games. Thank you very much for watching. If you found anything in this guide useful at all, please let me know, either commenting below or join me on Twitch. I'm normally streaming five nights a week at twitch.tv forward slash Josh Strife Hayes. I hope to see you in game sometime. Take care.